the objective is that once we go through the book of Ephesians, we have a clear understanding of all the blessings that God has given us. And the wisdom and knowledge is how to tap into those blessings uh, to become who God has called us to be. That's what we are after. We want a clear understanding of what that looks like. So as we move about each day, we will be able to speak the promises of God into our life as we seek to uh, be a representative of the kingdom of heaven being restored from our past. We're in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to pick up at verse 3, and we're going to focus on verses 3 and 4 today. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a, new, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ in, he in things in heaven and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we, uh, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession through the praise of his glory. Let the church say amen. 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 As we look in verse 3, we are told that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, that we would be holy and blameless before him. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that verse is talking about you. Just like anything in growth and beginning, uh, there's a lot we don't understand about what has happened to us. Young people, as young children coming into this world, uh, there's a lot of things going on in your life you don't quite understand. Because you're going to a place. And regardless of how long you've been here, you just haven't been here long enough. Regardless of how smart you are, you just haven't been here long enough to be as smart as you need to be about who you're supposed to be. We need to understand that because it plays a major role in how we respond to life each day. Adults, of course, you've been here a while. You see what they want to do. You know what they want to do. You know where they want to go uh, because the road hasn't changed. It's just the people on it have changed. The scenery is still the same, even though it's a different day. It's just being recycled. And after you've been here a while, you'll look at the time and you can see what cycle we're in. A lot of times, all you have to do is look at the clothing, look at the pursuits. It's just a repeat of something that's already been played. But unfortunately, young people, it's your first time on the block. And you just can't believe we that smart. We're not that smart. We are just more, uh, we've had more exposure to things that you haven't yet. And I know right now it just sounds like old folks trying to convince you to do what they want you to do. But uh, rest assured, we felt the same way too. We responded the same way too. We were determined to do our thing too. And as we go through time, there's a place that you're waiting on called adulthood. Where in the back of your mind, you're going to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, and as long as you want to do it. I mean, we, we can talk all we want, but we're waiting on that day. I can't wait to get grown. I can't wait to get out of school. 
I can't wait to do my own thing. But you ain't adding the right variables when you make that statement. How am I going to handle that stage? Am I ready? Do I have the resources necessary? Plan comes, you know, with expenses. Doing what you want to do comes with expenses. And the question becomes, am I really prepared for what I want? 99.9% of the time, we are not. Because we've spent too much time wasted on hoping we get there. Arguing with folks, tell them we're going to be there one day. I'm going to do it now, but I want you to know I'm rebelling all the way, and I'm only doing it because I have to. And I'm only going to do enough to get away with it. Are you hearing me? Then we look back one day and find out we should have been spending our minds on different things. Because when you get grown, folks want you to be grown. They want you to be on their own. I couldn't wait till the nest was empty. Especially when you start off with a full nest. Didn't know what an empty nest looks like. Some of you experience that. And your children don't quite understand what that meant to you. They've got caught up with the love that you're showing for them, the sacrifices that you're making for them. And they're just thinking you just don't have no kind of life. All you got time to do is worry about what they're doing. You don't understand. They're trying to make sure when that moment comes. <laughs> you ready? Ready to go. So you don't have to come back. Because they missed that time when it was just the two of them. Running around the world when they felt like it. If you don't want to come home, you don't have to come home. If you don't feel like cooking, you don't have to cook. When you put some down, it's where you left it. You don't understand the value that that has to your parents. Getting dressed knowing that there's not going to be any spit up on me by the time I get to where I'm going. Or going out to the restaurant looking nice. Knowing your kids are going to come and put their hands all over you and they may watch. Yeah. Finding out that your best clothes now are not to be worn in your best time. They have to be used as everyday clothes. I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but we are talking about transitioning into a place. And we need to understand that everybody was like you one day and they still like that. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it by themselves. Do your own thing. And we brought to a place in Christ where God is saying, I understand you. I understand what you want. And I have the perfect formula for you. And not only that, I'm going to do you better than your parents did. Even though they did you good, I'm going to do you better. Uh, when I get you on this road, I'm going to give you every single thing you need. So you don't have to be coming running back to me after every month, after your check is gone and at the end of the month. You call and looking for help. I'm going to make sure you are totally and completely satisfied. So with that, he said, he's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's a place where stuff don't rust. People don't come in and steal it. You know, it don't get outdated. It is always, always usable for any situation. And the objective of establishing your new life in Christ is to return to pre-fall days. Pre-fall, before humanity failed, God said, look, I want to take you back to a time and place when things were well. When pregnancy did not come with pain and suffering. When working wasn't a grind. You always had plenty. You didn't know what needing more was. Or being short. I want to take you back to a place when you look at Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it says that if you will obey God, he will bless everything that you put your hands to. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. When you get the time, go read it. I know you know it like the back of your hand. But also, we've been so focused on the good things. You need to keep reading Deuteronomy 28 from 15 to 65. Where it tells you about what will happen if you don't obey God. And when you read through Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 65, you will start to see some familiar places. 
running when ain't nobody behind you. <laughs> like the more you plant, the more you lose. Uh, when you thought you had enough, you found out it won't enough. People are constantly breaking into your gardens and taking your stuff. You'll find some very familiar places. The challenge is, on my part, I would like to find my familiarity from 1 to 14, which ends with saying you won't be lending no more. You, will be, uh, you won't be boring anymore. You'll be lending. You will be the head, not the tail. Sometimes does it feel like you just don't have no control of your life. You just holding along, and somebody else making all the decisions impacting your life. You ever feel like that sometimes? I know you don't know nothing about that, old people, because it's been a long time. But young people probably feel like that, don't you? Your parents just stay all up in your business. They want to see what's on my phone. They want to see what I'm doing, who I'm talking to. And you think they just ain't got nothing else to do, they just being nosy. They just being what they call the good stewards. You were given to them. And they know they're going to be responsible for you for So he gave us every spiritual blessing. Now I want you to understand that word every. Because sometimes I think we forget when we're talking about every. Every means all of them. There's nothing left. And if you believe that, uh, have you been asking God for anything he's already given you? You see, the Lord, if we go back to the beginning, he says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. That was his work. God took the man and put him in a garden. To cultivate it and keep it. That's pre-fall condition. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God has you here to cultivate and keep. The church is God's garden. The world is the field. The church is God's garden, his people, his building. And you have a responsibility to keep it and cultivate it. When you hear the words keep, uh, what do you think about? <coughs> Would you keep this for me until I return? You just keep on, all right? <laughs> keep means continue. To, to take care of, to keep it, to hold on to it. Basically to possess it, to keep it. You're going to keep it and to cultivate. Cultivate, what do you think about? Cultivating. Oh, boy. Nobody here know nothing about no farming. Mm -hmm. Cultivate. What does cultivate mean? Cultivate. See, I told you they know nothing about farming. It's already there. I want you to keep yourself now. Does that make better sense to you? Keep yourself. When you hear keep yourself, what do you think about? Take care of yourself. Look at this. I mean, it, 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 it goes more than eating well, doesn't it? Look at some of these hairstyles in here. <laughs> you know, look at how we uh, kept. We call, we, we kept. You see somebody like, you, you ain't being kept. <laughs> Well, that's when you ain't kept, you at Walmart with your pajamas on. That's right. That's right. You, got a, you got a rag man in your head. You, know, you ain't really freshen up. And I, and I just want you to see this, but don't you dare mess with it no more after I tell you. Are you hearing me? I want you to see the picture. And I know you won't see it because you, you look beyond those things. But, but there were some that would believe that my head is not kept. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I want to give you a slight picture to show how it can vary. Just because it may look unkept to someone else, doesn't mean it's unkept to you. Mm -hmm. 
So your keeping is based on how you keep. <laughs> Not how I keep. How you keep. And you will be placed in the garden accordingly. To be kept. He said, I want you to keep this garden. I have a responsibility to keep you. To cultivate you. This is why I'm here today. I need to keep you. Cultivate you. Some of you call it putting pressure on you. Some will call it, you know, putting you on the spot. Because I couldn't cultivate you like I just cultivated myself because I have to keep myself kept too. But I also have a responsibility to let you know what keeping is more important. Because sometimes we focus on the wrong kind of keeping, which leaves us unkept. He put him in the garden. And he said, I want you to cultivate and keep it. But then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. God has created a man with free will, but he only gave him one instruction, one command. Don't eat from a certain tree. You need to understand this because we can see from God's standing with, we can see that man's good standing with God was based on obeying God. And this was before any law came into being. You need to understand that. So when we go back to the beginning, God had a command for man. He gave him privilege and variety. He gave him one command. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the other trees are yours, including the tree of life. But see, just like children, Adam didn't understand what all these things meant. What is life? Why would he acknowledge that tree specifically? As he did the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You don't know nothing about evil. And there was a tendency sometimes when you don't know nothing about something, you try to pretend you know something about it or want people to think you are about it, like the hood. Who would be excited about being in the hood if you really understood what a hood was? So he told the man, listen, don't eat from that tree. You know, but just like the fall, he had to choose. He gave him a choice. He didn't make him. He said, listen, this is your options. And I give you this one thing I tell you not to do. And of course, from experience, you know what happens with the mind when you tell it not to do something. First question becomes, why? What is it about that that you don't want me to do? What is it about Jimmy you don't think I should be talking to Jimmy about? What is it about Mary? And then you become curious and you start to investigate, speculate. You see, as we all know, Adam and Eve's decision prevented them and all humanity from experiencing the life and relationship with God that God intended. As you are recognizing in your life, as you have been given instructions in certain areas, that the decisions that you make sometimes are causing you to lose access and advantage in certain situations sometimes because of the decisions that you choose. See, God's intention in the garden, in the humanity was that God should be glorified by man obeying him while being trained to represent God's nature and character to humanity. This would, allow, this would have allowed humanity to establish a replica of heaven here on earth. You see, as long as the man was obeying God, he had a relationship with God. Because he told him that the minute the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. Well, what does that mean to Adam? We have hindsight to know that that meant spiritual death. And Adam died at 930 years old. And he died spiritually the day that he ate because it separated him from God. 
It then tells how long he had been walking with God before that decision. But the walking with God kept him connected with God and talking with God gave him the knowledge he needed to program his mind in the things of God. So his mind would love the things of God and seek to pursue and carry out the things of God because that's all that his mind was receiving at the time. That's why we should be focused on being aware of what we are putting in people's minds because that process has a purpose. You see, God's intention in the creation was that humanity should glorify him by obeying him while being trained by God to represent his nature and character through humanity. This would have, would have allowed him to establish a replica of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. As we've come into this new life, he says, pray, let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let it go back to where it was before the fall, because this happened before the foundations of the world. And God is trying to get us to understand this is where it was in the beginning. That's why God says and wants us to understand that it's not what we accomplish that makes God happy. It is not what we accomplish that makes God happy. But we've been trained in religion to work to make God happy. To do this or to do that to make God happy. Some of you may be thinking about what can I do to make God happy. God is not happy by what you do or what you accomplish. God is happy about who you become. What type of life will you live? And who are you as a person? That's what makes God happy. You need to understand that because that's the way it was in the beginning. He required nothing of the man but one thing, not to eat of this tree. You keep it, you keep the garden and cultivate it. You have to understand it wasn't a wild world like it is today with briars and cuckabirds. It was just a matter of just keeping it. There was no death involved. There was no decay involved. It just grew and stayed pretty like artificial flowers. All you have to do is dust them. And sometimes that becomes too much of a chore for us. We just let them sit and collect. But to dust them, you don't have to worry about making them grow. You just keep them. Keep them. And in a perfect world, there was nothing wrong. Just keep it. This is the mindset he wants us to get back to. You as a child of God, I want you to keep it. I want you to nurture it. I don't want you to figure out how to make it grow. I don't want you to decide when it should be growing. I just want you to keep it as it grows. Nurture it. Be aware of the things that are happening and be aware of how to put something in place uh, to counter it. You know, uh, we, we in societies that all you have to do is change instructions or change rules to fix a problem without ever addressing the problem because the rule fixes the problem. We have a few pro we have a few rules here. You know, don't eat in church. We didn't tell you who was eating in church. We just knew somebody was. And we solved the problems that would cause the rather get all bent out of shape about who did and let's catch them. It's like, well let's fix that. Let's just put in a rule. No eating in church. Guess what had happened? It prevented everybody from eating in church. There was a few that still every now and then, you know, they still testing their skills. But God knows. And this is what God wants us to understand. We have power and authority to accomplish things if we can move back to pre-fall days, which brings us to our third principle as we are talking about the benefits of being born again. Being born again equips you to be who God created you to be. Because he gave us every spiritual blessing. And we have to understand the purpose of the blessings. It's not about what you accomplish or to do what you want to do. It's about becoming who God created you to become. That's what the spiritual blessings were for. All the physical things are gifts. The blessings are designed by God to equip you to become who God created you to be before the fall. Because he's come to fix the problem with the fall. Not your pocketbook, not your wallet, not your desires, 
Those things are promised to you, to promise to be given to you, so we can know what to focus on. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. God said, I've given you every spiritual gift. But those gifts are for you to live and be who I created you to be. Live like I created you to live. Live in a manner that represents my character to a lost and dying world. So we can establish the kingdom of community, which is the, was the plan in the beginning. It wasn't about getting rich, being famous. It was about looking like God. But you can see through the fall how the world has deceived the, the children of God because the only thing that the children of God and man focus on is the stuff. That was never the reason for God having you. He gave you all of that. That was never intended to be the focus as a child of God. But regardless of how much God blesses us spiritually, we can't seem to put the joy in that as we do when he does something physically. That is the problem. We have misunderstood why God sent his son to this world and blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You should not be measuring your success by the physical things that you accomplish. You should be measuring your success by what you're becoming, who you're becoming, and what type of life you're living to represent. So the question becomes, knowing that information what type of life do you want to live? <clears throat> it all starts with you. As born-again believers, you now have the opportunity to choose which quality of life you want to live and who you want to represent while doing it. That's what Christianity is about. That's what being born again is about. You now get to choose what quality of life you want to live. The ball is in your court. What quality of life do you want to live? You might not know, but you know that it requires resources to do whatever it is you want to do in the physical, right? Well, you might not know what you want to do, but wouldn't you like to be prepared to do whatever you want to do when you decide you want to do it and have all the resources you need up front to do it? Wouldn't you rather be in that position? Mm -hmm. They say it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not get it than to get it and not be prepared. How many times have you not been prepared for some of the opportunities that have been presented to you? Wasn't that a bummer? <laughs> oh my God, they got some nice property down there on the lake, and this is all it costs. It's a steal, and, and you can't close the deal. God knew that thing was going to come, but the question becomes, what type of decision did you make when you gave your life to the Lord which is determined by your pursuit after you gave your life to the Lord. Because the average professing believer doesn't have time to receive the promises. They're too busy working and trying to get what he promised. And you miss the main thing you need to receive what it is you're trading time to get. He's promised to give you those things. And he's already given you everything you need to guarantee that you have those things. But there has to be a shift in our way of thinking. You see, there are several things you must take into consideration before making your decision uh, and what you want to be in life. Considerations that Adam didn't have in detail. Or the information or knowledge to understand. The first thing is, you need to understand that God created you for a purpose. When you're going to make a decision about the type of life you want to live, first thing you need to understand is God created you for a purpose. Ephesians 2.10. God created you for a purpose. As you are determining what quality of life 
you want to live. Young people, you just don't realize the opportunity that you have before you if you could grasp what we are teaching here today. You have up front what Adam didn't have. You have up front what a lot of us as adults didn't have, having the right information you need to make the right decision based on what you want to accomplish in life and a guaranteed blueprint that it'll happen. The second thing you need to know is that God paid a high, paid a high price to get you back. Debo stole you from God. And God came back and paid the ultimate price to get back what was already his. You need to understand that. Because some of us sometimes, do you really want it that bad to pay for all that is yours? They've taken it, you know what, I'm not going to be deeper in the hole. I'll just cut my losses. God paid a high price for you. Third thing you need to understand, God's will is that you live a life that represents God and his kingdom. As you're making these decisions about what quality of life you want to make, you need to understand that God's will is that you live a life that represents God and his kingdom. God's will is that you live a life that represents him and his kingdom. God's will is that you live a life that represents him and his kingdom. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. God's will. And the key to life is knowing what God's will is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 through 8. God's will is that you live a life that represents God and his kingdom. That's what this is all about. Restoring you to back where he had you in the beginning. So you can start over with the proper information and all the resources that you need if you want to find a house. If you want to be a movie star. If you want to be an all-star athlete. If you want to be the smartest person in the world. If you want to be a rocket scientist. Whatever you want to be, he's giving you a guaranteed blueprint and formula to make sure he gives it to you. Not work for it. But who can believe such a thing? After trying on your own for a period of time, you're going to start looking and testing. I might need to test that because what I've been trying to do just ain't working. And if it's working, it's not worth the price that I'm paying. The next thing you need to understand that God offers for you, his offer for you about this new life is unbeatable. You cannot find an offer anywhere on the planet that can beat God's offer to you. Can't find anything out here from the world in any form that could beat what God is offering you if you would just look at the offer. If you obey me, I bless whatever you put your hands to. I give you an abundance over and above what you would ever need, more than enough. I give you good life, long life, and good health. That's his offer. I'll put you above everyone else. People will fear you and they'll know that you are my children. People will become poured into your bosom blessings. That's his offer. And you don't have to work for any of it. I'm going to give it to you. All you need to focus on is obeying me and I'm going to give you everything you need to guarantee that you obey me. Not that you might sometimes say, I guarantee that you obey me. Because I'm going to put me inside of you to make sure I be me. All you got to do is get out of the way and allow me to have control. I'll give you everything that you want. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. And while you're there, go and read down to 65. So you can see the options, consequences. You can't beat the offer that God has given us. And if we were talking to man, 
he would make these kind of offers. Put it in writing as a guarantee. Everybody will be standing in line to get a part of this. Man, you know what? Down the street, they're giving you an offer to give you unlimited resources to do anything you want in life. And it's written as a guarantee, and they have the resources to carry it out. It ain't going to cost you nothing. All they want you to do is be faithful to their company. Now, the company is legit. It does all that it does is good. Ain't nothing bad about it. All you have to do is represent that company everywhere you go. When you talk about life, you talk about this company and how it benefits your life. When you talk about how you feel, you talk about how being with this company has given you good health. That's all you got to do is to promote it. You don't have to sweat and labor like a dog. Like a dog. All you have to do is when you get up each day, wherever you go, just talk about this company. Now, how hard a job is that? <coughs> and we all like to talk. I mean, if you don't like to talk, I believe you will learn how to talk with such an awful way. I mean, I, I, I read about LeBron James. You know, had, you know, it's something about numbers when you see him. The guy at 18 or 19, whatever it was when he went into the NBA, $460,000 a week. A week! $460,000 per week. You're in your mind, you can't even do that with that, can you? <laughs> $460,000 per week. God said, that don't even touch what I got in store for you. Now, come on, y'all. I'm like a person I heard a while back. That might present some problems in life. Making $460,000 a week, I'm sure it's going to present some problems. But I don't think they will outweigh your desire to experience those problems. I think you'll probably be the first one to run down there, and you'll be up like they do at those uh, Black Fridays and, and the food giveaways, where people are up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning getting in line waiting even if it's snowing. They got a tent set up because they're going to make sure they keep their spot. Because I'm going to get some of this stuff, and that's all we got to do? Well, why aren't you in line with God right now? Because that's what he's promised you. You can't see him. Cause you don't want to find the things don't go right, do you? Where he live at? <laughs> I need to be able to see it. Where his statement at? I need to see it in writing. Well, it's in this writing, but that don't count. I need a separate paper with my name on it. <laughs> it says Curtis Palm. That's too broad. It could be everybody except me. Because man, do you like that? But God said, listen, you can't beat this offer that I'm offering you. And the next thing you need to understand, the consequences of not accepting this offer is devastating. <clears throat> And that's where Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 62 come in at. Not 65. Now these are your options. You would have a, a good slave owner, or you would have a bad slave owner. The world is programmed, you, you know you got good witches and bad witches, good bad guys, and bad bad guys. But they never talk about good guys. That remember, you know, it's, it's, it's like a Mercedes. When you could just have the Mercedes. It is not what we accomplish or what we do or how we feel that makes God happy. It is what we become, how we live our life, who we are as a person. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter how much resources you have. None of that phases God because all of it is His. Like, like you don't phase your parents when you walk around in, in nice clothes and, and you look good and everybody are complimenting you and you're feeling great about yourself. That don't phase your parents. You know why? More likely, they bought it. That's no big deal. They want to know what you're going to buy when your time comes. 
That is why God started all over from scratch at your new birth, giving you a new heart, a new spirit, putting his spirit inside of you, and taking away your old stubborn heart that he gave you at the beginning because he wants to make sure you are successful when you accept his offer. He gave you these spiritual blessings up front. All you have to do is follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. To top it all off, he put the Holy Spirit inside of you. He put himself inside of you. The guy that made you this offer down the street. He said, to top it off, now this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to do all the requirements myself. And I'm going to give you everything that I promised. That's more than a human mind can handle. Who does such a thing? Why do you even need me if you're going to do it yourself? Because I love you like that. I want you to be successful. That this offer about these gifts. God said, look, I'm going to make sure you do it. I'm going to guarantee your success. And please let this sink in. For those of us that feel we are not being successful, feel that we are not where we need to be, feel that our people are not going to be where they need to be. And the problem that probably exists is you just need to get out of the way and stop sucking gas in the Holy Spirit. And let him do his job. Not every day when you come in, you're going to question how you're coming. How, how far are you along in this project right here? It looks like you know, it looks like you're kind of behind. I don't see any evidence that you, I mean, you've been working today? Or you've been all fishing or something? I mean, I don't see nothing happening. I mean, they're just as crazy as they was before I took them to you. And now they're driving me crazy. Now you're driving yourself crazy trying to handle something that you're not equipped to handle. Because God is trying to get you to understand that wasn't the agreement. The agreement is, I told you what I would do through you. But can you trust me in what I have promised? What I have promised? In verse 5, we are told that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Very important that we would be holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless before him. A lot of the old theologians have not translated this word before the foundation of the world properly. It is used in two different ways in the Bible. One talks about the cosmos, the earth. The other talks about human nature, human society. For years in studying this, I, it always puzzled me because it talked about how Satan was thrown down to the earth and all of this before the foundation of the world. Well, when did Satan get thrown in? I mean, to make all, I mean, what, what was going on? That's because at that point in time, I was looking at it from the perspective of cosmos talking about the world, the foundation of the world, which in my mind meant when the world was being created. So I would stay in the creation and try to figure out where Satan came in at to mess this up. But I thank be to God that God, even though he hadn't made that point clear, he already let me understand what he was talking about which is why you've heard me talking about pre-fall condition for the last several years. Going back to the creation. Where God wants us to go to pre-fall state. So when you actually read this verse, it should say, um, God chose us in him before the throwing down of human society. God created us in him before the throwing down of human society, basically before the fall of man. God created us in him before the fall of man to be holy and blameless. That's what it's saying. His purpose for man was to be holy and blameless before him. Because when he created him, there was nothing to blame him for. He was created innocent and without the knowledge of sin. That's why God only gave him one instruction so that he could choose. But that was a reason God had put him in that position to have to choose. To cut that part of it short. 
about that word, because the word used uh, in this text for before the foundation of the world is the word kosmu, K-O-S-M-U, which means human being. In the other 18 places in the Bible where this word is used, it is used cosmos when it talks about foundation. There are about 16 places like this here that talks about cosmo, humanity. Very important to understand that because then the Bible makes complete sense. And what he's saying was, This is important because as a child of God, when we talk about being obedient to God's word, there are those who will try to use the argument that we have been freed from the law. And when you talk about being obeying God's word, there are people that because of grace say, look, we've been freed from the law, that believe they have a free ticket to kind of live any way they want to live and just ask God to forgive them and it's okay. That's because they don't understand this concept, this context about before the foundation of the world and how God intended things to be because the law came in after the fall. And the law never came in for the righteous person. It came in for unrighteous people to let them know that they were not lining up with God. God already has us on this page about how to go back to pre-fall condition. So in this concept, God is plainly states in his word for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. But we see in the garden, God planted the man in the garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed, what we just read. Out of the ground the Lord calls to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. And there, and the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. But the Lord told the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will die. That was the first and only command that God gave man before the fall. That command only talked about obeying God. Obeying God has always been the way. Man was never willy-nilly to do whatever he wanted to do. He had the choice to choose, but it was not God's plan. God's plan from the beginning was for man to obey him. And we have to understand that God established love for him and humility as the foundation for human society. In the beginning, God established human society on the concept of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said with that, you have fulfilled every commandment that ever came after this. The point we're trying to get us to understand is where we need to be as children of God and how to handle these blessings uh, that God has given us. Because God says in his word in 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than fat of rain. For rebellion is as the sin <coughs> of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. You need to understand, this is how God sees disobedience. When you hear people talk about divination and witchcraft, Ouija boards and all that stuff, that's called divination. God said when you're obedient to the word, he sees it in the same light. Look how many people practice divination from God's perspective, which is the only thing that matters. The disobedience to God is like divination, witchcraft, and insubordination going directly against the leadership. That's why the enemy has you as children practicing insubordination to your parents. Parents, you should not, you cannot, you must not support, support insubordination. 
You never support insubordination in your family to your spouse from your children. You are teaching them that they don't always have to follow authority and leadership. That's idolatry and witchcraft to God. It opens the door for Satan to now devalue leadership. That's where God intended to be in the beginning. That's why he sent Jesus to explain God to us. To help, to help us understand that God will wipe you out if you operate in disobedience. He explained to us why it was okay sometimes not to follow God or agree with God. He never let us believe that we were okay in thinking what we were thinking, even though our words were right, but they were never right when it came to honoring and supporting God, the leadership, the authority. That's why we can't enjoy the full blessings of God, because we are in witchcraft, in subordination, in our own subtle ways. This is what he intended from the beginning. This has been his concept, his idea about sin. Well, why is this such an issue? Which brings us to our fourth principle. It provides an opportunity to move to pre-fall state. Being born again puts you in a position to move back to pre-fall state before the fall of humanity for the corruption of the foundation of the humanity, which is love. Not what you do, not what you accomplish, it's love. We already knew this, but we want to see it from God's perspective and where it started at. Because God is love. Ephesians 4, 17-24 says, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the left life. God hears because they, are, they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you've learned about Christ since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. By lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new in nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. See, Jesus came, died, buried, and was raised again to provide humanity a way to return to this pre fall state of being. And that was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 24. So when you read the scriptures about the things that God has called us and how he wants us to act, you can see that's where it was before the fall. The problem is we try to describe life and explain life about situations after the fall. We want this sin and stuff to make sense. It don't make sense. It is deadly. It is against God. That's why we have to understand our role is to take control of our minds and taking authority and replacing it with the character of God. You can't let those conversations go on in your mind. You have to ignore them. Take authority over them and give it to Jesus. And when he comes back and want to talk about Jesus' work, he said, that's, that's, that's not acceptable. See, we have to be careful how we subtly practice this insubordination. You've taken it, you've talked to God about it, you've taken authority over the spirits that are involved, you've commanded them to leave, you've called in the spirit to replace it because if the house is clean, when the spirit comes back, you're going to be in worship because you have to reestablish kingdom authority, <coughs> pre-fall conditions. <coughs> How would God respond to this? You call all that in as a good manager. You talk to the CEO. <coughs> You tell him what you have come up with as a manager, but you see that it's wrong. And once he gives you okay, that that's okay, you now take it to your power source. I've talked to God. <clears throat> this is what we've come up with, even though you know he was part of the coming up with. You take it to him and say, listen, because he's a power agent, this is what I've come up with. 
after discussing with God, now I need you to take this and make it happen. <clears throat> You're excited, aren't you? Well, tomorrow, when it don't look like he did his job, what you do? What's your mind do? Because you don't do it. Did you, is he, is he, did you get that to him? It don't look like nothing happened. See, now you're practicing insubordination. You're not respecting who he is and what his responsibilities are, and you're questioning whether he's even qualified. It's so, <coughs> so what should you do if you know it's done? When, this is your part in life right here to get back to this place. Because you wouldn't do that. Your spirit created an image and likeness of God. And you're supposed to serve God in spirit and in truth. That ain't you. I don't care how good the case is, that's not you. Because you already know that's a done deal. I've now repossessed some more property. It may take a time to clear the vagrants out, but it's mine now. So when that thought comes up from your mind, hey, uh, your job as a good parent, a good spouse is, that's none of your business. He know what he's doing. Under no circumstances do we question his work or God's work. Now what we're going to do, we're going to practice faithfully believing that they're doing what they're doing, and we will never, ever question them again. That's your part of sharpening the learning curve. Teaching that disobedient, disrespectful, divination practicing, insubordinating mind of yours, this is not proper behavior that represents me. Yeah, I, I understand. She, I understand what she said wasn't right. And I understand that, that what you're saying is right. You do not do that at no cost. They don't know what's right. They haven't experienced true rights. And what's right to them is what they think their rights are. They want it now. God said you need patience. You need endurance. So you can't expect anyone else to be obeying God in your world when you don't even trust God. You constantly question him. Oh, look, man, I, uh, we prayed for that last year. I mean, God, it don't look like nothing happening. Uh, man, I wonder did I make the right decision. And all your mind is saying, we, we should have went somewhere else. We should have trusted him. We should have did something different. Because look how long he's taken. He been gone. Man, this, I, I, I told him this 10 years ago. He ain't did a thing yet. This is why, because it's proven who you have faith in. And none of that stuff is your problem. That's the Holy Spirit's job. If you gave it to him. Your job is this. This is how you expose this. You give stuff over to somebody else to do. I want to know how much you trust. You want to know how much you trust each other? Give somebody you know here something that you critical to you to get done. So look, I need you to take care of this. I trust you guys, because I ain't got time. I'm gonna move on, take care of some other things. And that you let and just let me know when you're done. And just never look at it again. But you know when you gave it to him, you had some expectations. You want it done at a certain time. God said this ain't about what you accomplished. It's about what is going to allow you to become or reveal what you're becoming or who you really are. Look at the time we've been wasting in life. And insubordination, wonder why it doesn't happen yet. Every hour, you like your spouse, say he's going to get to it. We got jokes about it. He's going to get to it one day. And your thing is, one day could be 100 years from now. But he's still going to get to it. And that's the way we treat God. Man, I pray for my kids. They're going to be growing and doing before anything. They ain't nothing going to, you want to have them before they leave, don't you? You want to see some proof. And you just want it for selfish reason. I want to feel I did a good job raising my folks. 
So when they go out there, folks gonna know that's that's Curtis folks right there. They know how to act. They hard workers. They respectful. That's what you want to hear. I like child. I saw your child the other day. I could not. I had to look so I could not believe that was your child because they ain't nothing like you. Them things were off the chain. But yeah, you know, we can only do the best we can do. They grown now, you know, we got the thing, they got to live their own life. But in the back of your mind, you be like, <laughs> embarrassing me. Now I feel like I'm, I don't know what you're feeling like. But it's not pleasant. That's why you refuse to receive when people tell you, you got some memorable children. Mm. They know how to act in public. Mm -hmm. And you were looking at them the whole time, they were out. Stop that. <laughs> Why y'all doing that? Be quiet. Put that down. <laughs> and folks looking at the same kids like, wow. <laughs> I, I want to pay for all y'all's food today. That was something to behold. Mm -hmm. And you said, I've right, been, these kids have me stressed out since I've been here. Get that out of that chair. <laughs> Why y'all all over there? Get back over here. Why are you over there looking up at that folks' face? Get over here. Stop talking so loud. Get me right here. What you... And everybody's like, wow. The whole place is like watching y'all. You think it's because they acted crazy. You're like, wow. Everybody's like, that's a nice family you got there, sir. Wow, that's just so, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Who they talking to us? They don't see these knots in my head because these same critters have not allowed me to enjoy my experience out here today because I'm constantly looking at them. And you need to understand, push comes to shove, worst case scenario, regardless of how they look now. And you're concerned about how they're going to be in the future. First chance you get, look in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to learn how to cultivate it, keep it, and how to operate in an environment that looks like they somebody, they not. Mm -hmm. You said they outgrew it, don't even how to hide it better, that's all. We have to understand. Our role, you recognize what needs to be done? Talk to the Lord about it as a good manager. Discuss it with him. And as you're discussing it, he will give you confidence that you've got a good plan. Or he'll counsel you and say, this is what you need to do. You in turn will do your job and take authority and clean out what you need to clean out. Bring in what you need to clean in. Thank God for letting it happen. Dispatch the angelic host to now protect this property. You got that? Then you take it to the Holy Spirit look, okay, this is what we need to have. I know you got it. That's your thing. I got other things to do because I'm enjoying this little break. I ain't seen nothing else on the table lately. So I'm enjoying this little break that I got. Now, you can take care of that, and I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing in my good, happy place that we've already repossessed. When you have repossessed that, let me know. But I ain't got to be thinking about that no more because it's too much of a burden anyway. But your mind ever, ever tries to question or talk about that subject, you know you got an insubordinate mind that's been practicing divination, witchcraft. And we need to fix that because that's our job. He told you to renew this. He told you to renew this, and he would take care of everything. That's what taking your cares to God look like. So now he can protect your heart and your mind from itself. And you can take authority to renew it. Those insubordinate behaviors you have going on in your family, in your life, in your mind, that's your job. That's your job. Yes, you've given it over to Jesus, but he's also told you in the process while I'm taking care of that. If you need to put the rod to him, put it to him good. It'll, it'll be part of the process. That's your part. But do you have the heart to put it to a good? It won't kill them.
but it'll drive that foolish, insubordinate, definition practicing mindset from you. While we take care of our part, because you got to be taught some things too. To put God first. Never did he say we will sit down and discuss this. So you can understand why I want you to do this so that I don't give you a beating. No, I need to know do you need one. I will know by your behavior, because never did we sit down and say it is okay for you to talk back, disrespect, or question our leadership. You just ain't been here long enough to do it. You don't have enough experience, I'm sorry. You don't have enough experience to be trying to tell me how to run my house. You don't know what's best for this family. What you think is best is making a mess. You will be a mess out there with the world and every world will have trouble with you all the time. Every time we look around, you will be having issues with somebody. See if I'm lying. See if I'm lying. But if you have a dealt with this insubordinate spirit, you will always try to find out where the authority was wrong. The authority wasn't perfect. Because the authority is not perfect does not give you any right to be insubordinate. Never. Ever. I understand why I was, I was a stickler to it growing up, and we were just taught that under no reason, son, do you ever have the right to talk to no adults in a disrespectful way. You got a problem with what? Come home and tell me and keep your mouth shut. Because I will take care of you if you have said or looked out the way. I don't ever want you to think that it's acceptable. I don't care how smart you get doing it, I'll be able to have, I'll be able to tell what you did. And I ain't going to be trying to justify why you did it. I just told you that's not acceptable. We were told that. I got beat by my neighbors being grown because I went from home. They beat me. I went home and told mom and dad. They did what? They won't. What you do? I ain't do that. What did you do? You did something. What you say? Look at the words you said. And what was happening when you were saying that? You know what? It don't make no difference. They told me that you were disrespectful. You come, come on in here. They ain't over there. I said, get in here now. I'm going to give you something to cry for, boy. I done told you about that knowledge. I know you. Thought I was going to go home and get some relief. But that second whooping drove all that foolishness out of my mind. <laughs> hey, hi, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You do? Oh, yes, sir. I do that. Mm -hmm. Because it's not acceptable under any reason. Any. This is what our problem is. We were talking about how to shorten the learning curve. How to get back to pre-fall state. We have an insubordinate divination mind that practices rebellion against authority unless you agree and believe that is right. God gives you one that are not right. So he'll see if you are insubordinate or not. Anybody can follow good leadership sometime. That's your job. That's your role in the equation. Yes, I know that's the Holy Spirit's job, but there's a standard here. I can't support that. I wish and I love you, but I can't support that behavior. I can't. Because it's not going to do you any good when you leave here. It's not going to do you any good while you're here. We have a problem with you now because you don't want to follow the authority. <coughs> Nowhere does he tell us to have a discussion. He says submit to it. That's the way it was before the fall. That was his intention. And everything you've been witnessing and been written on how to take care of these issues is useless information. Time out. I saw when time out came in. It didn't do nothing but make a bigger mess. 
talk to me. And I started off like that, got to know the, got to know the Lord, sit there and explain to your children what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I spoke out of line when I, when I, when I gave you uh, what I had to give you yesterday. And uh, I want to apologize, which was good, teach them how to apologize. But don't you think for one minute that you ain't going to get another one? I, I never said I was perfect at this. I said I'm learning, but I'm going to do what I know I need to do. With my, the Bible tells me clearly. I ain't got to be looking at Put the rod on them. <laughs> it won't kill them. Do it early. Because <laughs> if you don't do it, you don't love them. That's why we have the mess we have. A group of insubordinate individuals that do not support authority, and we have a society that supports it. Mm -hmm. Which makes it justifiable in your divination practice and mind. That's what God says. He said, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. See, Jesus came to die in his word to release us from this. See, because when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6, 20 to 22. Therefore, my brother, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who raised, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which arose by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been raised from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The newness of the spirit is the pre fall spirit, which was about obedient to God. Nothing else matters. You take care of that, everything else will be taken care of. But you weren't called because you were okay. You were called because you were messed up. You had an insubordinate mind that rebels against authority. And to practice operating in authority, you got to practice operating in every authority in your life in submission. Under no circumstances will I ever tell you it's okay not to obey God. I never have, I never will. Because it does you no good. Yes, my husband, my husband is beating me, and he's about to kill me. This is what I believe I'm staying. He's going to kill me. This is what I want you to know the Lord says. If he's not committing adultery, he requires you to stay. Now, if you decide to leave, that's between you and God. But if you leave, this is what he requires of you, to stay single. You how old? 27. Mm. You might live to be 80 or 90 or 100. You know that? That means no more sex unless you get back with him or her. Let's keep it all on the table. Let's keep this real. Do you believe from this day forward that you can go without any more sexual environment? Yes, I can. I said, I know. Don't talk hastily. You're in a different state right now. But three weeks from now, or a month from now, or a year from now, the fire gets lit. It's lit now, you just can't recognize the burn because of your other burn. But hear me clearly. If you make this decision, this is what God requires of you. And if your desire for sexual encounters, you believe may rise, you might want to work this out. Now, that's what God says. Now you have been properly informed. Now whatever decision you make is between you and God. That one young lady told that. Stay with him. She hadn't committed adultery. 
She couldn't stay. Guess what happened three weeks later? She discovered he was committing adultery. Too late? You didn't leave him for adultery. You did not leave him for adultery. God don't work on that kind of plan. But she couldn't stay single. So she's gotten married again, calls herself a pastor. Insubordinate spirit keeps you in insubordination throughout your life. Now, how do you fix that? Do you leave this? You go back to the first? Now you got to wear that one. You got to wear that one. Don't have yourself dressing in something for the rest of your life because of a temporary situation. You must trust the word of God. You must trust authority, because in trusting authority and respecting authority, you are trusting and respecting God. I had aunts and uncles when I was growing up would constantly come by my mom's house and, you know, I'm a kid being nosy like I always was. I was just curious. I need to know what's going on in the world so I can fix it. I'd leave it. Come on, man, we getting drunk and got y'all running. I'd leave. Now, meanwhile, they ain't got no more husband. Because it ain't right. I thank God that my mother stayed faithful to a marriage. Her being faithful and my dad having his issues allowed me to set standards for myself. I will never fight my wife or a woman. I will never be a drinker. If I get married, I'm never going to get a divorce. I'm going to work like my daddy works, but I ain't going to act like my daddy acts. That's what they gave me. Because there were certain things that were just not acceptable. Because of what God said. I, did I respect, disrespect it? No, I didn't. Because that was not allowed. Did my mother sit around and tell us, uh, you know, just kind of get along with your dad because, you know, that's just the way he is. No, she didn't. She always presented him as the authority that you better respect because there's only so far I can protect you. Certain lines you cross, I'm going to walk away because I know if I cross that line, See, God told men to love their wives, but he told wives to respect the husband. The average woman doesn't know how to respect a man. The average woman wants a man to love her regardless of how disrespectful she's been to him. That's subtle insubordination. A woman don't know how to tell a woman to love a man. You got to ask a man how to love a man. Mm -hmm. And there is no cookie cutter fit for nobody. And this insubordination starts in our families. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. That was Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Way tells us no longer to act like we did before we knew the Lord. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Because when you were slaves to sin, you couldn't do any better. But now that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and slave, Savior, you've become his slave. You are free to be obedient and do what is told. Please, people, we have nice and subordinate people. They have kind, gentle spirits in your mind. But don't let that kind, gentle character trait make you overlook insubordination. Insubordination to God is when you question what he is supposed to be doing. He even goes on to call it blasphemous when Jesus was talking to the Jews when they were accusing him of what he was doing was by the devil. He said, look, you can, you can talk about the man of God, but please don't talk against my work. Because you talk against my work, you're talking against the Holy Spirit, you're blaspheming against God. 
So we're looking at all these places trying to figure out where we went wrong yet. God told me when you are operating in fornication, there are consequences. The consequences for uh, my daughter. Not only was I practicing fornication, I was operating in witchcraft because I was getting high and doing drugs and father was high. I know I was high when she was conceived. Now all of that comes with consequences. And don't even try to pretend nothing else. Those are the facts. So when I look at her and people try to say she grown, she should be doing better, I say, look, in my spirit, I play the role in that. Because I was doing that spell for one solid year, 24 hours a day, I was high. With no breaks in between. Hear what I just told you, people. For one solid 12 months, I woke up high, I went to bed high. I stayed high all day long. Because I had plenty of whatever I wanted to do that. You know, I pass. Yes. I wake up in the morning with a tall Budweiser and a joint while I'm in the bathroom uh, taking care of my paperwork and my business. My first break was at 9 o'clock. I lived from here to the second house over from where I worked at. Well, I walked home to lunch each day and break. At break, I hit another joint or two or three. Took me to lunch, where I did the same thing over again with maybe a bud or a beer or a hit or something else that took me to my next break at three. Then I got off at four, five. And you know from four to five, what I did between that time was get out. It's during that time my daughter was conceived. Are you hearing me? That played a role in her condition. Because even though I knew about God, God says you're not honoring his God, and he gives you over to these things. Not only did I do that, I left them alone. When we know that it's the man's role to give the family their identity. So yes, she has issues. Yes, I played a role in those issues. Because there's consequences to behavior. That's why I take ownership of that and I make myself available to help fix that. But under no circumstances would I compromise who I stand for and what I stand for to try to make up for something I cannot make up for. It's about making a decision if you want to change. What I'm telling you is this. You play a major role in where your people at. The major role. And when you really look at your life from God's perspective, you are no different than they are. You're probably a little worse off because you're supposed to know better and be sure of them how not to follow the same footsteps. I made that decision when I gave my life to the Lord. Under no reason will I be an insubordinate, divination practicing child of God. Regardless of what it costs me, who it costs me. Because I owe God and the world at least that much. Because of his mercy and grace of sparing me through all of this. You have to understand that it's your responsibility. Because don't let nobody deceive you. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the devil's work. Insubordination is the devil's work. Not following authority is the devil's work. Not submitting to authority is the devil's work. You haven't been given the right to put up with anybody. You have not been given the right to put up with anybody. You haven't been given the authority to tell somebody that they can be who they were supposed to be. Who do we think we are? That says we're insubordinate, divination practicing people 
who are professing to know God. Therefore, you must focus your mind on what is essential and build on a lifestyle that represents God and his kingdom. That's what you must do. That's what this word is about. That's why he gave us every spiritual gift that we need. We've been saying, how do I shorten the learning curve? How do I stop all this stuff that's coming up in my mind? That's how you stop entertaining it. You can't stop entertaining it here if you keep out entertaining it out here with others. You have to practice. You have to stop entertaining certain, certain conversations that you know don't line with who God's supposed to be different. So you have to be aware of whether you're going to be a benefit or problem. And you've got to establish your authority to do so. We're going to hear some music. I want you to think about that. Uh, let's give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs> As we've been presented with this precious opportunity, uh, to get right with God on this. It's between you and the Lord. <laughs>